We're in 2 Samuel 21, and now you've read it. You read it. Do you get that kind of ugh, feeling as you read kind of the beginning of that? And you're going, you know, it's kind of a funky chapter. We are, uh, it's amazing what areas of debate, or what areas of scripture become areas of debate about goofy things. And this is one of them. In 2 Samuel 21, we are really in a text where there are some people who want to argue over when this happened. Did this happen next, or did this happen a while ago? And they try to sort of reconcile it in a lot of ways. Definitely, we're going to move towards, and when we're, think about it, we're almost done with 2 Samuel. Is that crazy? Which means we're almost done with David's life. And we move from here then into the wild rampage of, of Solomon, the downward spiral of him, and then the crazy anarchy that takes place afterwards, like sort of a civil war. Uh, and that's, of course, before the age of Ultron in uh, the King's books. Well, with that said, uh, there is this chapter here where our context for all of this, I want to remind you, is getting the king back on the throne. And over the last few chapters, we have seen the king leave, not because he wanted to. And after the sun is hung on a tree and pierced through, we're in a place now where, the, where there can be this place in between the two. It's a place we all face, to be honest, if we're not careful. A place where we're well aware of the fact that Jesus saves us. That's how we say it as a Christian. We call him Savior, but for him to take the throne as our Lord, that's another story altogether. And what we saw in the last two chapters was that there were a group of people that were all talk. We need to get the king on the throne. Conceivably, yes. Yes. Intellectually, yes. Idealistically, yes. Practically, not really. And these are people who really know it's the right thing to do, but don't do it. And please hear me in this. The easiest sins to identify are the ones where you know you shouldn't be doing it and you do it. Here in this country, we certainly have those kind of laws. If you steal or you kill unless you have an amazing lawyer, chances are you'll go to jail for it. But there are other things, by the way, and we forget about these because they're easier. Well, to be honest, the only way to not break them is just not doing them. So doing nothing actually keeps you from doing those. However, there are other things that are required of you that you have to do. For instance, pay taxes. And there are certain things that are required of you that you have to do that are required either in one time or sort of in sort of periodic installments or in constant upkeep. And these things, too, that if you don't do them, you can go to jail for those, too. We just tend to forget those things. And so what happens often is is that they become a little bit quieter and they accrue and they accrue. And then the next thing you know, you've got this huge thing hanging over your head. You don't even know how to get out of it. And we'll understand the reason I say that is there are consequences in both areas. The area, the sin of commission where you actually do something you shouldn't and the sin of omission where you don't do what you're supposed to. And for the people to all sit around and talk and say, we should really make, in our case, we should make Jesus king of the throne. He should be on the throne of our lives. He should be making the final say. Well, that sounds really good in church, but let's face it, most of the decisions you're going to make are going to be outside of this building. And the decisions which really practically, and not idealistically, but practically put Jesus on the throne of your life, on those areas, let's face it, the clearest areas of submission in anyone's life are the areas they disagree with. Because it is in that situation where you know you're submitting or not. And who in their right mind doesn't want God to bless them? And the Lord would say, I want to lavish you with this, and I want to lavish you with that, I want to bless you with this, and overcome you with peace and joy. And love. Who in their right mind doesn't say yes to that? But when the Lord says, here's something I'd like you to do, I'm commanding it, and you're like, oh, I really don't want to do that. That's when you really start to see whether a submissive heart is actually there or not. And unfortunately, we can live a good period of time without actually hearing such a challenge. But once we hear it, it becomes clear and evident. In a situation here, David had seen a group of people that were all talk, and he's like, hey, you guys, you've been talking about getting me back on the throne. How come no one's done anything yet? 
So Judah does come and get David and bring him back. And as Judah brings David back, we start to see some of the things that change as a result of that. Things that have to be sort of laid to rest that the king takes care of. He starts laying to rest people like Chuba that would uh, obviously cause trouble and was cursing David as he had fled. Well, he deals with that gentleman, by the way. Well, I'm using the term loosely. He deals with that guy, in essence, by issuing forgiveness but with a stark warning, if in essence, to go and sin no more. And, and we start to see these different, these different individuals where David really starts to deal with them. All, by the way, in great grace and, mer- and mercy. But somewhere then we get to this chapter, and you start to see that there's more in getting the king back on the throne. Well, there's, to be honest, more than just watching the king do stuff, too. When Jesus really does take the proper throne of your life, well, certain things start to take place as well that become our responsibility. And as much as we don't like to, and of course we're aware of the fact, by the way, that when God records something, just because he records it doesn't mean he endorses it. There are a lot of sins recorded in Scripture that God does not applaud. He just shows us our own hearts. And in showing us our own hearts, we look at these things and we realize there's something really wrong here. And that's, of course, where we start asking for that mercy and grace. So David now has been brought back onto the throne, and now that David is back on the throne, accounts need to be put in order. And so regardless of whenever this took place, because it's really irrelevant to me whether it took place at this moment or had it taken place before, what's clear is God saw in his divine wisdom to put it after chapter 20, and because of that, that's our context then, is this king taking the rightful throne. With that then, we see second chapter our second Samuel chapter 21, and it says this. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years. Year after year, it tells us it wasn't like a famine on and off. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, it is because Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now, the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel. They were actually remnants of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn to protect them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Stop. That's where we get this. Lord, please burst open your scripture. Speak, Lord. I know that as we've read through it, there's parts of us that that go, ah, one in the world is going to come out of this. Lord, make this so real and so personal and so applicable to our lives that, Lord, we make the changes that need to be made and we allow you to make the changes you want to make too. So, Lord, in this chapter where we see that place where you put responsibility on us, but you also put responsibility on yourself, Lord, let us see the things you want to accomplish and the things you lay in our hands to sort of step into, things that we'll be required to step into. Lord, please speak a word or words into each of us today that we could become different people, better people that look more like you. So, Lord, Pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us and draw us deeper and captivate us in your word that tonight would be your night. We commit this to you every second, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Like always, please don't just believe me. Don't just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible always be your authority. Like I say, don't take my word for it. Take the word for it. Now, we're dealing, first of all, with this issue of a famine. Famine, of course, in an agrarian culture comes from a lack of rain. And God brought us all the way back for what it's worth in Deuteronomy, in three different places, Deuteronomy 11 and twice in Deuteronomy 28. God makes really clear, by the way, that part of that rain is a supernatural thing. In other words, God is holding the rain directly related to our obedience. He tells us, by the way, in chapter 11 of Deuteronomy, verse 11, the land in which you cross over to possess, this is the land they're in now, and uh, is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land in which the Lord, your God, cares the eyes of the Lord are on it always from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And it shall be if you earnestly obey my commands, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Well, then I will give you the rain in the land in its season for your land in its season, uh, the early rain and the latter rain that it may gather in your grain, your new wine and your, and your oil. It's important to recognize there's an earlier rain for certain crops. There are things like barley and some of the wheats and so forth that, that are the barley and things like that that take place at the earlier portion and the rain is necessary for that. But in the latter rain, you get things that are important too that are sort of like the, those sort of autumn fruits 
uh, that take you all the way down to the end of the wheat harvest. So there are times where the rains are necessary on both sides. In essence, there is a rain necessary for the beginning of the harvest, and there is a rain necessary for the end of the harvest, for what it's worth. And of course, that carries you through the winter as well, which is the rainy season. And he says then, I'm going to give you that rain in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather your grain, your new wine, and your oil. Verse 15, and I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived. Not just your mind, but your heart, where decisions are really made. And it says this, you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you. And he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which in the Lord, which the Lord is giving you. In Deuteronomy 28, it says this in verse 12, in regards to the obedience, the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, and give you rain in your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand, that you will lend to many nations, but you will not have to borrow. On Deuteronomy 28, verse 24, it says, on the other hand, if you're not willing to, the Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust from the heaven, and it shall come down on you until you're destroyed. So understand, first of all, when there seems to be a lack of rain, just from my understanding of the Torah, there's a part of me that starts to say, okay, what's missing? Where is the disobedience? Where is the thing that isn't right with you, God, that you're withholding the rain? Now, there's certain things you can kind of try to fabricate and try to make happen, but in the end of all, no matter how much you sort of dump stuff in the sky, there still has to be water in the air to get there. And, and God, God knows how to take care of us, but he doesn't want to bless our mess. He doesn't want to, in essence, bolster our disobedience or cosign our sin. And so with that in mind, God wants to withhold things at this moment so we would get thirsty enough and dry enough that we would turn to God and go, God, what in the world is going on? What is not right with you? Famine, as we see here, by the way, is something God often uses to motivate his people. Genesis 12 and 26, Ruth 1, it was a time to get God's people moving, but it was also a time, as we see in Genesis 41, it was a time to get, in essence, that was where Joseph would ultimately be reconciled to his brothers. God used a famine to reconcile something that wasn't right. Now, what isn't right? For three years, you start to see, and think about it, in the beginning, it just means there's a bit of a blight, there's a little bit of an extra heat. Imagine what would happen as David starts to look around, the scientists start to say, global warming, David, and, and on, and things are getting drier, and they're getting drier. By the second year, things are getting a little bit more sparse. By the third year, you kind of look and go, man, we're in trouble here. Something has to change. And you know how that works in your life, because it works that way in mine, too. You get that place where in the beginning, it's just that things get a little harder. And they get a little bit less fluent. They just, things just don't flow like they used to. They become a little bit more, they take a little more effort. But ultimately, it goes from this place where it wasn't just free flowing and everything smooth and full of grace to where it's a little bit more uh, effort to the point where you just start reaching in and you're not finding anything anymore. And you're just going, oh my goodness, we are in trouble here. God, what in the world is going Wouldn't it be nice if we cried out to God earlier? We were like, God, things are just aren't going there's something that, you know, it, it just seems like I'm underwater as I'm doing these things versus before it was just so easy. Or what am I missing here? What, is there something not right? Now, understand, God can do this for a lot of reasons, but it's important to recognize that if we seek the Lord and we're honest with ourselves on this, there are going to be moments, by the way, where the Lord is going to clearly just tell you, here's a change I need to make in you right now, and I'm going to need you to do something with me on this. We're going to need to make something right. But what happens if you cry out to the Lord and your heart is open and your ears are open and you don't hear anything? Well, then what do you do? You wait. You wait and you trust that it is God's responsibility to speak to you. He really knows how to speak to you and he knows how to speak to you at a time when you can hear. The beautiful part is, is that you just want to be in a place where you're available to hear him. So what happens when you say, God, what do I do? Where do I go? What do I do? Where do I go? And you don't hear from God. Do you realize he is answering? Because what you're hearing from God is nothing. That's what you're hearing, right? So you're like, God, what do I do? All I'm hearing is nothing, God. What do I do? You do realize the answer is right there, right? And you realize that's exactly what Isaiah was telling us in Isaiah 40 about waiting on the Lord. There's a big difference between waiting on the Lord and waiting for the Lord. 
waiting for the Lord would be like a husband who is clearly ready and he's at the door. He's started the car now. He's ready to pull out, but the wife hasn't gotten herself ready yet or whatever. And he just, he's, he's, he knows where he's going. He knows where he wants to go and how he wants to get there. And this girl just better catch up. He's waiting for her. But waiting on the Lord is more of a situation where you're now kind of this, you know, this afternoon on a train or this morning on a train, a central line, and you hop on this train and you're there and it keeps getting more and more clogged and it's not going anywhere. But in the end of it all, you can't tell the train to do anything. And if the train were to say, we've decided we're going to go one more stop and then just stop, all you can do is sit there or stand there and wait until something happens. And you can't tell it what to do because it's not going to, it's not going to listen to you anyways. Believe me, I've tried. And the reason I say that is, is the Lord tells us to wait on him. Now, there is a place where we wait for him, and that's in regards to his return, because he's made really clear what he's going to do, and we wait for him in that. But when it comes to our lives right now, we wait on him, because the Lord may move us, and, and some of us, we just don't like to see something change. So we're kind of cool with the woman, and God's like, I'm going to move, but I'm going to do it my way, and we're going to do it in, in, in my method, and, and here we are figuring the whole thing out. And God's like, look, if you wait on me, chances are I'm going to do it way different than you think, but I'm going to get better results than you ever would get. Now, who are these people that there's a problem? Because understand, David sought the Lord and the Lord spoke to him. So David sought the Lord and he's like, all right, God, three years of famine, something's not right here. What's up, God? And God told him that there was a problem and the problem, result, the problem was a result of the Gibeonites. Now, back in the book of Joshua, chapter 9, Gibeon was a group of people when Joshua crossed over into the promised land, and he was just, he was invincible. Well, in theory, Jericho fell, Jericho fell, and it fell hard with a crazy act of faith, running around, you know, blowing your horns and screaming. Uh, and it really, the methodology was really not as important because people try to try to figure out the scientific point about it. The whole point was is that God had you do something crazy and if you trusted him and did it his way, he was going to make it happen. I, I mean, it's, it doesn't matter what God could have. He could have just said, I want you all skipping and singing, here we go around the mulberry bush. And then what would have happened is scientists are like, what is it about a mulberry bush? But in the end of it all, it was just like, I feel so weird just kind of walking around, not saying. I mean, the whole point was it was an act of faith. And with that, of course, the walls of the article fell. And then, of course, everyone runs in and there's a great victory. But then, of course, there's this defeat in Ai. Uh, and it's simply because, you know, they really didn't take it very seriously. It seemed it was so little. It's only two letters. How in the world? How hard could this be? You know, and they don't, they don't send the full thing at them, the full army. And in the end of it all, they actually are very surprised to get chased out. But there's another aspect to it. There was a guy who had compromised, who had stolen some stuff from Jericho, though God told him not to. His name was Achan. He really lives up to his name in the end. A really rough situation for him. But in the end of it all, God purifies the camp, and as he purifies, then reconsecrates the camp. Well, then there's a victory there. And then you start seeing that there's this great victory. Well, the Gibeonites were relatives of the, they were descendants of the Amorites. And they start seeing that now Israel's just beaten everything in front of them. And so they're like, hmm, well, hand-to-hand -hand combat probably isn't the way we're going to win this. So what it tells us for what it's worth in Joshua 9 is that they basically throw out this kind of little show. They take some guys, they're going to go there, and they go like, hey, now let's make this thing look like we've been on a really long journey. I remind you, Israel hasn't familiar with the land. So it's sort of like you're showing up here, and, you know, and you're brand new to London, you're in Covent Garden, and someone's like, we came from a really far place. Where's that Leicester Square? How far is that? Oh, it's so far. And that's kind of the key in this. So consider the fact in this, they don't know, so they have to play the cue. So that means what they do is they, they put on old clothes, they have old food, you know, their wineskins are all old and torn apart. And what you have then is that they kind of go, check it out, we've gone from so far. And Joshua does not do what he's done before, which is seek the Lord and ask, all right, Lord, is this for real? And so in essence, what happens is he gets conned by a group of people. And they're like, look, we're just really, really far away. Could you make a, make a covenant with us, make a contract with us that you guys will never attack us? Now, regardless of the fact, and it's interesting to note, regardless of the fact that they were lied to to get into this covenant, they still got in a covenant with them. And because they got into a covenant with them, they had to keep the word. That's the point. 
And the scripture tells us, by the way, it is important that a person who ascends to the hill of the Lord with clean hands and a pure heart, who hasn't raised his hands to an idol, it says, who swears to his own hurt. And you realize it is so important for us as Christians to keep our word. Now, in this situation, there are three years of dryness and hunger and vacancy because in the end of it all, there were a group of people, they got into this thing and said, look, you guys are safe. We're going to protect you. And then somewhere in Saul and his madness, he just starts killing them all. Now, that's weird because it wasn't David. Think it through. This was the king before him, but David is still representing the same government. And in that, David cries out to God. He's like, God, what is up? We're all starving here, and you're supposed to provide for us. Clearly something's missing. Is this that Deuteronomy thing? And God says, hey, there is a problem, and here's the problem. There was a covenant you guys as a nation got into, and you backed down on your word. And because you backed down on your word, you need to go make it right. Now, granted, the way that David tries to make it right is gets a little funky, but the point is still this, and here's the point for us. If the king is going to take his rightful throne, when he actually does take his rightful throne, as David now has been reinstated, there gets a place where God starts to stir your heart, and you start to go, here's an area of dryness in my life. And as there's an area of dryness, God says, you know what the problem is? You've wronged somebody, and you haven't made it right. And let's face it, man, when Jesus isn't on the throne like he's supposed to be in your life, you use people. Your word is a means to an end. People are a means to an end. Because the satisfaction you had when you sat at the table of the Lord isn't there. And unfortunately, when God moves in, that's a really big spot to fill and nobody can fill it but him. So then you really, then you really it's like, You've been at the Brazilian barbecue and now you're eating Asian food. And I'm not trying to, I'm just playing a stereotype where you know you're hungry every half hour. You know, and you're like, man, this just isn't working. You know, you've been in Italy and everyone's been hugging and kissing you and filling you full of pasta and you're just, you're like, out of your navel is coming pasta. And then they're like, oh, that was just the appetizer. And then, and then you're kind of going to, to France where everyone's kind of giving you like one pea and then they drizzle something on there like it's art, but it's not food anymore. You know, and they're like, and you're like, Man, and how many of those plates do you have to order before you get full? And that's the way life is when, you got, when you're feasting with the Lord and everything's like, yes, and it's, I've got joy and I've got peace and things are so good and people are nasty, but I'm, it's, I'm over it already. And then you like walk away from that and you try to get into something, you try to do it in the world and then you're getting your little pee and your drizzle and you're like, this just isn't doing it. And here's the point. Is it somewhere if you ask the Lord, now you're like, Lord, now that you're on the throne of my heart where you belong, you're not just Savior, but you're really Lord. Well, then you ask him, hey, is, is there somewhere where I've really wronged someone in all of this that I need to make right? Now, in this situation, this is one of those places where God says, this isn't something God's just going to do. You need to step up and do it. Because let's face it, God could just say, well, I could change their heart. But God gives us the blessing of humbling ourselves and saying, man, have I said something I shouldn't have to someone? Have I talked about somebody? Have I maligned somebody I shouldn't have? Or have I even just agreed with somebody that I know was lying and I've given them, in essence, bolstering in their lie? Because I wanted to be a friend or I wanted to be a comfort or whatever. Let's face it, sympathy sometimes comes at the expense of truth. And God says, you know why you're dry? Because you need to make this right. So David does the one thing you would expect at a moment like this. David goes and he starts asking the people, what, what do we need to do to make this right? Now understand something here, because I think there's an interesting parallel. And that is, that though the five kings would gather, by the way, against Joshua in Gibeon, where these people are from, it is also the place that has a history that's more, more close to David. In 2 Samuel, by the way, if you remember, there was a time where Joab representing David actually stood against Saul's predecessor at that point, or I'm sorry, Saul's successor, who was his son. And they had 12 guys apiece, and they said, well, you know, why should we fight? Let's just get 12 guys out there to kill each other. And all 12 killed each other. So there were 24 dead people. They were sorry, 12 from Joab's side, you know, and 12 from Abner's side. And so they called that place for it. It's with Chalchat Chatzurim, and it means 
The Field of Sharp Swords, which to me sounds like a cool kung fu movie. Field of Sharp Swords. But it, what it was, was it's the place you just remember. This was a place where a bunch of people just killed each other. Interesting, because that same guy, Abner, is somebody that Joab is going to kill, even though David forgave them. Listen to that. David gave him a covenant of peace and said, Abner, you're safe as far as I'm concerned. But Abner had killed Joab's brother. You killed my brother, prepare to die. And with that, Joab's got a vendetta against him, and he doesn't care what the king says. Listen, listen, listen. The king, the king, not your friend, the king says, this guy has been forgiven. And someone says, no way. Because what he's done to me is different than what he's done to you, king. And no matter how, no matter how much forgiveness you want to issue, I'm still not going to do it. So he winds up killing the guy instead. And all that takes place at the same place. The place, if you think about it, Gibeon's kind of the place of broken promises. It's the place of broken vows. But it is also the place for what it's worth where David also issued peace to another enemy general. His name is Amasa, the one who was the commander for Absalom, which David just fled from, and that's the whole situation we're coming back from. And David said to Amasa, hey, I want to make you my commander. Clearly, there is a declaration of peace and forgiveness, and the same Joab says, no way, man, and guess where he kills him? He says, hey, brother, your cousins, are you well? Oh, you are well. Well, don't get used to it. And he kills him, and in that, he does so here, and I get the idea here that from Joab's perspective, because as I'm looking at that for me, and not just for you, I'm looking at that and going, wait a minute, are there people God has issued forgiveness to that I won't? Hey, there are people who've really done horrible, horrible things. Now, if some I can look at and go, you know what, that person was just a nutter, I'm not trying to be mean, they really were off the rocker, and they've flown off the rails, and it's easier to issue compassion and forgiveness for someone like that because you can kind of go, well, I don't know how much of that was a conscious choice. And then there are others where, man, what they did was just so evil and so harmful and so full of malice and venom and spite. It's like just hearing their name still part of me that's kind of like I still feel something. And I'm like, God, you forgave them. I need to forgive them. Because somewhere in this this place of broken promises, if you will, is a place of dryness. And it is a place of famine. Now look at forgiving someone doesn't mean that you let a maniac back in your house. Forgiving, in the simple sense, means you cast it off and you abandon it. Not them, it. And the idea is, you know what? I'm not going to carry this anymore. I'm done carrying this. I'm done carrying this thing. God, get this pain off of me. Get this weight off of me. Get this bitterness off of me. And when I look at this place, I can't help but think, oh my goodness, this is a really serious event. Now, let me ask you, when you started reading this, did you think that's where we were going to go with it? But it's exactly the place that we're looking at. David says, why is it so dry here? Why am I starving here? Why am I so hungry and not satisfied? God's like, you know why? Because something's not right and you need, you need to make it right. It's a place of broken vows. It's a place where the king issues forgiveness and you don't want to. And you're like, well, I don't have the power to forgive. If you're not a Christian, by the way, I fully agree with you. Because you're trying to do it in your own strength. But as a Christian, the one who forgave Hitler, the one who forgave Nero, the one who forgave Jack the Ripper. Now, that doesn't mean Jack the Ripper received that forgiveness but it was issued, lives inside of you and me. And if he lives inside of you and he lives inside of me, he can make that happen. And I want to do this before we even get any farther. I want to pray for us right now that if there be somebody that we need to issue forgiveness to or if there's someone, by the way, that we have used or maligned or allowed them to do so, that we would make it right that we would take the step and say, you know what? I have broken my vow. I've, I've misused my word and I've broken my word and I want to make right with it. Now, 
What if they're like, well, forget it. You're just a jerk and I hate you. Well, you can't make them do their part, but you can do yours. The same thing that God issues forgiveness, but there are people who won't receive it, but at least God's hands are clean. Oh, man, could you imagine what would happen if we walk out of here going, you know what? Lord, even if I don't have anyone that comes to mind right now, I'm giving you permission to speak to me in this area, please. But also, would you give me the strength and the courage that I'm going to need to do this? Lord, I just pray even before we go any farther that you would do that with us. That you would tonight speak to our hearts. And if there's anyone, Lord, that we have broken our word with, we've made promise we haven't kept, or you've issued forgiveness and we have no interest in doing so, but rather we still seek vengeance. Overcome us right now and speak to us, Lord, and let us be willing to make that right. Please, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. David said to the Gibeonites in verse 3, and we better move on. We're in verse 3 now. What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement? I want to make this right, that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord. The Gibeonites said to him, we, have no, we will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. That a little bit weird because of what's going to happen next. Don't kill any man in Israel for us, but... And then so David's like, well, cool. Well, if that's the case, if I don't have to give you money, I don't have to kill anyone. Well, then whatever you say, I'm going to do it. Whatever you say, I will do for you. Verse 9, and they answered the king, as for the man who consumed us to plot against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul. Now, I'm assuming hanging them is going to kill them? And this is a kind of a weird moment because they're like, look, we're not going to kill anyone and we don't want any money. David's like, well, then I'm in. Whatever you say, I'll do. Guess what? David just got into a verbal contract now himself. Now, I don't know why, to be honest, David didn't say, hey, you said don't kill anyone. I'm assuming hanging isn't just getting a rope swing for them. These are going to kill them. But David is going to actually, he's going to try to keep his word. And again, I remind you, God isn't applauding this, but David is seeking to make it right. Well, hang them before the Lord in Gebeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And, the, and it says, uh, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, well, I'll give him then. Or literally, I will give. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath. Remember, David made a promise to protect Mephibosheth. He is not going to go back on that promise. It was, and it says, that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So who did David take instead? He's got seven people to hand over. Well, the king took Armani. And of course, you're probably familiar with him because he makes really expensive suits and watches. Uh, Armani. Anyways, he's right there. By the way, the name Armani, by the way, means one from the palace. And Mephibosheth. Apparently, there's more than one Mephibosheth we're dealing with. Again, I remind you, it means exterminating the idol. The two sons of Rizpah. What we're going to find out is that Rizpah is a concubine. And then it says the daughter of Ayah. Ayah, which by the way means falcon, whom she bore to Saul. And the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Michal. I told us, by the way, if you remember, Michal was the one when David brought the ark into the town. Remember, it's David's wife, or was David's wife that David came dancing and she's like, oh man, you embarrassed me. Man, you made a fool of yourself. Man, what are you doing out there making yourself act like that? Yo, nonsense. And, and of course, David's like, honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. You think that was embarrassing? Oh, wait to the next one because I'm calling a press conference and we're going to get all in our undershirts and we're going to just start dancing. You know? And it tells us from that point on, David wouldn't go near that girl and that she was barren. Well, that's kind of a weird thing. So how in the world does she have children if she was barren from David? Well, it tells us here, by the way, the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Mahalathite. Well, wait a minute. Who is Adriel? And who, by the way, how in the world does that happen? Who did she bring up that was Adriel? 
So wait a minute, there was this guy, Adriel, he's the son, that means he's a man, the son of Barzillai, the Mah- that's not the same Barzillai, by the way, because the other Barzillai was a Gileadite, the one that was kind to David when he was fleeing. So now, we're gonna, so now we have to deal with this other guy that's named, got that same crazy. So Barzillai, the Mahalathite, has a son named Adriel, and he apparently had five sons that somehow on the line, Michal then takes and starts raising. So who in the world is this? How do we get any information on this? Interesting in 1 Samuel 18, do you remember when David initially fought to be able to actually get the king's daughter, the Michal was not actually Saul's first choice? Does that sound familiar for some of you? Saul had an older daughter, and her name was Merab. And Merab, by the way, was supposed to be given to David. But instead, it tells us, and this is in 1 Samuel 18, 19, this is Saul playing with David. It says, but it happened at that time when Merav, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel the Mahalathite as a wife. Did you get that? In other words, this is Michal's sister who marries this guy, and the two of them have these children. It would have been David's wife. But instead, Saul gave her to someone else. They had a bunch of kids. And then somewhere down the line, she seems to step off the scene and Michal takes the kids and essence seems to adopt them. At this point now, it really isn't going to matter much. They're going to be handed over to be executed for what it's worth. So you have Barzillai the Mahalathite has this son. He marries David's uh, daughter, Merav, for what it's worth. Now, David is handing over seven kids. Two of them to one of David's, uh, to Saul's concubine, and the other five that was originally from the woman that was supposed to be his wife. And it says, He delivered up in verse 9 into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged him on a hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, the beginning of the barley harvest. We'll talk about that here in a moment because we're going to see the, the sort of, just so you know, it's sort of, so the beginning of the barley harvest. That's the beginning of the harvest. That's sort of the 17th of Nisan. It's basically the beginning of April, which, by the way, we're, we think about it, we're basically almost right there. So they're going to be hung, in essence, in a couple of weeks is kind of the idea. So the king taking the rightful throne, I need to get my life right. And one of the things I need to get right is I need to make sure that if I've wronged somebody with my word, I need to make it right. Now, Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah, who took the sackcloth. The interesting, by the way, the one that was the concubine seems to be more torn up about her kids than the other. And it says, Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah, took sackcloth, spread it out for herself on the rock, and from the beginning of the harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven, she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. Now what this tells us is, this is a mother's love. Her two boys are, in essence, if you think about it, her two boys have been executed. They're hanging on a tree, but what appears to be the case is they're not hanging on the tree overnight. They're hanging on the tree over summer. So she takes sackcloth, and either she spreads it on a rock to sit on, or she spreads it like a canopy to sit under, but she, in essence, guards the two bodies to make sure that nothing else starts nibbling on them through the course of that summer. She stands there and stands guard against the two boys as they, as they hang there. And that's going to be told to David. Verse 11. David was told that Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah, the concubine of Saul, had done. For what it's worth, by the way, it seems like God, because of all of this, though, still, because at least David sought to make it right, even though it's kind of crazy how it happened, God is still going to honor it. And it tells us for what it's worth, David was told about what this mother had done. The concubine of Saul, it tells us here in verse 11. David then went and took the bones of Saul, the bones of Jonathan, his son, and the men of Yabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the streets of Bashan when, when Saul, by the way, had died in 1 Samuel 31, where the Philistines hung them after the Philistines had struck down Saul and Gilboa. And he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there. And he gathered the bones of those who had been hanged and buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin of Zillah, in the tomb of Kish's father. So they performed all that the king commanded, and after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. It wasn't just that David had a bunch of people killed, and God said, cool, let's just get back to business. 
But what David saw was that these men were given a dishonorable death. And David then, to make it right, ultimately, would give them an honorable burial. He was going to resolve this thing with honor. So he took the bones of Saul and Jonathan, and he took those, and he took the, the bones of these guys who had been buried, or that had been hung, and he gave them a, an, a, burial, a, bury in their, a burial in their family plot. And by doing that, he wanted to give them a proper honor. Interesting, if you think about it, because what that means is they were killed like common criminals because they were a son. But they were given a grave with the rich, in essence. Well, for what it's worth. But I do find this interesting because this becomes the next thing in my, in my life as I start to ask. Is there somebody that I've really let hang and I've villainized but in the end of it all, I really need to put this thing to rest with honor. Or am I just going to sort of let all the beasts at it? Now, let's face it, when a Christian falls, the easiest thing to do, by the way, is just point, yell, and that's it. Now let's face it, sometimes they declare war on you and you have to back off. Because if you're going to step in at all, you're going to have to step in the fight. And that's not what God intends. But on the other side of it, there are times where you kind of look and you think, hey, if I dishonored somebody inappropriately have I actually went and villainized somebody to be honest who was just kind of somewhere in the fray of this they were really not the problem sometimes that happens I watch this with people where somebody gets caught in a sin and they villainize other people as if they were the cause of the problem and it happens by the way because it's so quick for us to shift blame that's what Adam did it's what Eve did so why in the world wouldn't we do it and they're like, well, this is your sin. And you're like, well, you don't understand. My mom, my dad, the world, my teachers, and blah, blah, blah. Well, look, at they may play into it, but in the end of it all, you're still a human being with a free will, and you have choices that you make, and you're going to be responsible for those choices. And let's face it, do you ever have a lot of faith in anybody who is willing to blame everything but themselves for their problems? I mean, how does that get better? Well, with that, then we get to the last portion of this. The Philistines were again at war. And let me just say this, Lord, I just want to pray one more time that if there is somebody, Lord, or even in our own lives, we are busy, Lord, dishing off the blame that we should rightfully take and get, in, and get right with it and just deal with it, Lord, and, and, and really put it out and, and, and get it right. But Lord, if we have villainized somebody else for our own sin, Lord, let us put that thing to rest right with proper honor. Lord, we don't want to blame somebody else for our sin. We still have our own choices. So please, Lord, let us walk out of here right with you tonight. Please, in Jesus' name, amen. Finally, in our last part of this text, by the way, there is a battle to be fought. And did you notice there are giants to be fought? By the way, it's interesting. Guess who doesn't have to fight any of the giants in the end? David. The king going back on the throne is gonna, is gonna let these things be dealt with. And, and by the way, let me just say, when you're letting the king take proper dominion of your life and then you want to go fight these particular battles, when it comes to giants, the king already has ordained ways to take them down. Your goal is to get right with those other things before this. Did you notice that was the order? Getting right with the people you've wronged because you're of your word and you've broken your word or getting right with those people you've villainized because of your own sin or getting right with the people that you villainized that really, to be honest, we're just kind of caught in the fray somewhere versus people that you really know were genuinely guilty for it. Well, when the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants went down and fought against them to the Philistines, and David grew faint. And, this, and I, the only reason I don't want to stop there is because at this point, we're just kind of getting punched in the gut and we're kind of trying to catch our breath. Here's where the great news comes in. Because what we have are we have victories. You've read through the text now. There are four victories over four giants. Did you notice that? Did you notice that the four giants that win or that are, that are fought, all of them are defeated. Two of them have a name, and the other two aren't even given names. One is an association. The third is an association with his brother. And then the fourth, because he's the six-fingered man. And, and I, I look at that, and I realize, okay, now how do I play this out? Well, notice where this guy's from, by the way. It says, the first guy, we get his name. The Philistines were again at war with Israel. By the way, it doesn't say Israel fought against the Philistines like they picked a fight. The Philistines jump back in now. 
Here you are, you're getting right with the, with the king. He's on the throne. You're getting right with people. And you're like, you know what? I was caught up in this situation. I lost objectivity. There was clearly somebody who was clearly at sin. And then I villainized you. And I shouldn't have villainized you. You were in the fray of it. But this was where the problem was. And I just want to ask your forgiveness for that. Or I've broken my word. And because I've broken my word, I'm asking your forgiveness. And I want to get that right. And at that moment, all of a sudden, the Philistines show up again. And it's giants. And you're like, giants? I'm just trying to get things right. This is your giants and understand in this it tells us they were at war again with israel david and his servants went down and fought against the philistines but david grew faint now if this is the end of david's life david dies at 70 that means david is somewhere in his 60s in this battle so i get the idea i mean i'm looking i'm not remotely that but i'm thinking man 60s and you're trying to fight giants i understand why and it tells us who the guy's name is notice his name in verse 16 ishbi benov now, any of you who have any clue what Ishbi Benov means, be weird if you did. Ishbi means he's a man who dwells there. Benov means of Nob. Wait a minute. Do you remember how Nob plays into David's life? Let me give you a hint, or just tell you that's the best hint ever, right? Is when David was fleeing from Saul initially, the first place he went was Nob. That was where the priest, the high priest was, and all of those people remember, and David's like, I'm on a secret mission. Dun, 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 dun. Where's Tom Cruise? I don't know where he is. I have to do it instead. I do my own stunts. I need a sword and I need some food. You remember that? And the priest goes, all right, well, the only sword I have is Goliath, and the only food I have was the stuff we just took down that was the, the table of showbread, and he's like, perfect, I'll take those. And he takes them, and then Dog was there, and he goes and tells Saul, and Saul goes mental and kills all of the people of Nob, and David writes, except for a escaping priest, um, becomes Abiathar, the same guy, if you will, you know, in all of that, that David winds up kind of using as a priest himself. And in all of that, David writes this psalm, you wicked, rotten person, you liar, you're killing people with your lies. And, and, you, and David couldn't have been saying it to Doug because Doug wasn't lying. The only person who was lying there was David. And the reason I say that is that had to be one of David's worst moments where out of a lack of faith, David, in essence, lies to get what he needs or what he thinks he needs at a moment like that. And as a result of that, a whole nation is killed or a whole city is killed and that city is Nob. Now, the reason I say that is, is in your life, you're trying to get right with God. And as you're trying to get right with God and you want Jesus on the throne and when you want Jesus on the throne and you're kind of, Lord, look at, I'm not asking you to review your past. I'm not asking you to start digging through your own dirt. I'm saying give God permission to tell you if there's someone you need to make right. And then what happens is at a moment like that, the enemy then loves to come in and condemn you. And he throws your past at you. Just like this. Remember your knob, that situation where you actually, you hurt so many people and you weren't really trying to, but you really did. And you think, how do I kill this giant? Here's the good news. You don't need to. It tells us, by the way, this guy was a big and formidable foe. He was one of the sons of the giant. The weight of his bronze spear was 300 shekels. He was bearing a new sword, and he thought he could kill David. This guy thought he could take down the king, but Abishai, the son of Zuiah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Does anyone remember what Abishai means? Abba means father. Abishai means gift of the father. And let me just say, when you have given your, you're like, Jesus, I'm trying to make you, you know, I want to make you on the throne of my life. And I start, and the enemy starts throwing all this stuff. And then you're like, oh God, I need the Father's gift to put this giant to rest. And watch what happens with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life at a moment like that. I love that's how this works out here. You know what I noticed, by the way? Did you notice that the devil never condemns the unsaved people? He never tells them they're going to hell. He'd rather tell them they're not. He only tells Christians that they're going to hell. Because after all, we're the only ones who care. Well, with that in mind, it's amazing how he tries to condemn us. So what happens? Abishai puts him to, he takes down that, and I just, and, and maybe there's an area of your past you just can't seem to escape and just say, God, please, by the power of your Holy Spirit, put that stuff to rest. Slay that giant tonight. Struck the Philistine, killed him. Then the men of David swore him, saying, hey, look at you shall no more go out to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. David, you're getting old. Could you let us do this from this, from this point on? Second now, and we're almost done. 
It happened after this that there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob. Gob means cistern. And then there was a guy named Sebechai. Sebechai, by, mean, by the way, means interwoven. The th- it literally means the idea of taking important things and putting them together in their proper place where they're interwoven so they become one thing. He was one of David's guards, his eighth captain, eighth month that he would have of his 24,000 men. I, I, anyways, he's a Judah, son of Zerah. And he's a Hushathite, as we see here. And he killed a guy named Saf. Saf, by the way, means tall or really spread out. And he was one of the sons of the giant. And I get this, because when Jesus isn't on the throne of my life, my whole life seems to be falling apart. And the important things in my life all seem to be, they just keep going farther and farther away. And it's like my whole brain is scattered. And God's like, you know what? Here's the beauty and all of it. I'm going to go and I'm going to weave that stuff back. I'm going to take those important things. I'm going to put them back where they belong. Scripture in your mind and in your heart where they belong. Lifestyle that actually glorifies me. Because right now that giant needs to go. And you ever have those moments where you're like, man, my life is so spread. It's like a hurricane. God, I really need you to slay this giant right now. God goes, I'll do that. I'll weave all of that together. The other two guys, by the way, notice, well, there was a guy, and for what it's worth, uh, then there was war at Gob, again, with the Philistines. And there was a guy named Elchanan, the son of Yara Oragim, the Bethlehemite, and he killed Goliath. Wait a minute, Goliath? Wasn't Goliath killed by David? Absolutely. But it is amazing in a moment like this, Oh, it's actually the brother of Goliath is the way we'll look at it. But it's like how we look and we are brought back to that place of despondency again. And it's like those things, the depression and that paranoia and those horrible things we had before we came to the Lord, we start seeing those things pop up again. And you know what's so great is the guy who takes this down is a guy named Elhanan. Do you remember what El is short for? Elohim, and what does that mean? Or Eloha means God. What does Hannah mean? Like John or Yohanan means grace. It literally means God's grace. And when I look back at those moments and I'm like, oh my goodness, and I feel like my past is trying to jump in again, and those horrible moments in my life where I felt so empty and despondent, God's like, my grace is going to totally take down that giant. Trust me on this. And finally, there was a war again against Goth. Remember, that means press, like an olive press. And there was a man of great stature. He was a giant, big guy. He had six fingers on his hand and six toes on each foot. Imagine how that guy could play football. Imagine how that guy could play piano. Anyways, 24 in number, we could count that. And he was also born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, it wasn't a problem until he actually sought to get his hands on Israel. Jonathan. And Jonathan, you have Yachan, that's grace. And Yah again. Yah Nathan Miller means God's gift. The son of Shema, Shema, David's brother, killed him. So the four were born of the giant, and they all fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So here it is at the end of this. I'm seeking to get right. I want to get right about my word. I want to get right about the way that, that I've handled other people. And as that's the case, God goes, now let me start taking down some giants in your life. Let me take down that giant that sort of, sort of runs back and tries to remind you of those horrible moments you really hurt someone. Now, I don't know about you, but man, I, if God started rolling film, I still get sick to my stomach when I think of those moments. The good news is they were before Christ, so I know God killed that guy. The guy in me, not just the people I was dealing with. And I realize it's like, all right, God, your gift, Father, lay that stuff to rest. That giant needs to go down. Then there's this issue of everything sort of spreading out and dispersing, and God goes, well, now let me put it all back and let me weave it where it should go. Then I look back at my past, and all of a sudden those things start, I'm like, those feelings and that anger and that stuff I used to have, and God's like, whoa, 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 whoa. My grace has covered all of that. It's over. That giant's laid to rest. And then like, and finally, it's like, well, what about why so important that he tells us, why didn't he just say he had giant hands or that he was just giant, he was a big guy? Well, when you see a guy with that many fingers, what does that mean? That means that guy's got a, quite a grip. Well, what about that area of your life even right now that you feel like just really has got a grip on you and you just can't let it go? 
It's like, I can't get out of this thing. God says, my grace, watch what I do. I'm going to take this giant down. Notice he doesn't say, now I want you killing those people. I want you taking down those giants. He says, look, at, this is what I want you to do. Get right with the, things you've, with the ones you've wronged. Then let me take down those giants. Now this chapter could have gotten really funky, but when I read that and I look at that, I realize this is a really encouraging chapter. Maybe you're in a place right now where you feel dry and you feel weak and you're like, man, this should be better. And God's like, you know what? You need to make things right. You make things right. Let me take down the giants. You know what's really cool? God will give you the power to do to get right. And then God, by his grace, will take down the giants. And we can walk out of here so refreshed tonight. And the greatest giant in the world was the sin and shame and filth of our, of our own sin. And we could stand before God in that guilt. And yet Jesus went, took all of that upon his shoulders and he took the greatest giant down. And when he forgave you, he forgave all of you. And when he rose again, he offers a brand new you that can walk in that forgiveness. But I want to warn you, there's nothing God gives you that is just sufficient. God always gives you in excess so that you then can dish out the overflow. So whatever, think about whatever God has given you. He's given you forgiveness. Well, then he'll give you more than you need so you can issue forgiveness. He's given you love so that you can turn and take the overflow and dump it on others. He's given you joy so you can go and offer and issue that joy to others. He's given you peace so that in overflow so that you can go turn then and issue that peace to others. And that's the way God works. So if you feel like I don't have it to issue, well then turn back to the Lord and say, God, would you overflow me in these things, please, so that I can turn and issue those to the people that need them. And there's the beauty of the offer tonight. Will you pray with me, please? God, I want to thank you. I want to thank you in a weird way for those dry moments that force us to turn to you. Where we're like, I should be more vibrant. Now, I recognize there are times where just physically we're worn out. There are times where there are circumstances that weigh heavy on us. But that shouldn't dry up our spirit in you. We shouldn't be spiritually dry in you just because the world gets weird or because circumstances get heavy. But I confess to you, there are times I crawl under things that I was never intended to carry. Because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And when those things weigh me down and chafe and choke me, clearly something's wrong. But I come to you right now knowing that Jesus died for all of my sins, took them all upon himself, and then rose again on the third day. And in doing that, Lord, I recognize even tonight, <laughs> you're so good and so faithful and so kind. Forgive me for not issuing the abundance that you've given me to others. And I just pray, Lord, that you unshackle everyone in this room and pour forth your rain. And Lord, if there be someone, Lord, that we've broken our word with, speak to our hearts and put a willingness in them to get it right. If there's someone, Lord, we have maligned, that we have made guilty that was part of the fray but not the cause and the problem cause us to make that right and give them the proper honor that's due them and Lord tonight if there are giants like this in our life giants of our past and the regrets that we have like Nob whatever that knob is for any of us. Or those places, Lord, where everything just sort of is spraying instead of coming together. Or in those places, Lord, where the emotions and the attitudes of our past are starting to rise up again. Lord, slay by your grace those things, take down those giants again. 
Are those places, Lord, where we feel something just has a grip on us or it's just beating us. It's kicking us and kicking us and we are not getting ahead of it. It is ahead of us. And, and Lord, it's just, it's always one leg up on us, Lord, and it's one hand on our throat. God, tonight, break us free from those things. Take down those giants by your grace. The power of your Holy Spirit. And let us walk out of here in the abundance of joy that we could issue that joy to others. Jesus, we confess you died on the cross for us. You paid for all our sins. You rose again. And we don't want to just declare you Savior. We want to give you the throne of our hearts and say, sit on it properly. And as you take that throne, Lord, then move us to do the things that we are responsible for and give you the space to do the things you are. As we commit ourselves afresh to you now, Lord, Make the inside of us right and then motivate us to make the world around us right, the parts that at least we could be responsible for. In Jesus' name, amen.